I'm delighted to welcome everyone to this international panel on Afghanistan, the once and future war, where I'm joined by the scholars to my left, David Edwards, Alessandra Mansuti, and Nazif Shahrani. I want to begin by thanking those who made this event possible. That is, in addition, first and foremost, to the speakers for agreeing to come. We have our partner units, both within the new Wiser Center for Europe and Eurasia, especially the Wiser Center for Emerging Democracy, and also our fellow national resource centers on South Asia and also on the Middle East and North Africa, who generously co-sponsored this event. The size of the event, and I suspect it will grow in the next couple of minutes, suggests how critical this day is. As I suspect everyone in the room knows, and also those who will be watching by remote video feed in at least two other locations on campus, the United States is currently, and has for at least the last six and a half years, been at war in the Central Asian country of Afghanistan. Now, this is an intervention that is only the latest from an Afghan perspective in a series of events. Um, and this originated, of course, after the attacks of 9-11 and has remained since then. It has faded from the front pages until recently uh, in response largely to events in Iraq, but is very much back. So we started thinking about this event last summer. And we did so when both U.S. major party candidates for president, amid all of their heated arguments and disagreements, agreed about one thing. That is, Barack Obama and John McCain disagreed vehemently about Iraq, about earmarks, about Joe the plumber. But even so, they all agreed enthusiastically that if elected, they would pour additional troops, armaments, reconstruction aid, and political attention into Afghanistan, which suggests that there is in the United States, or at least as of November, there was a consensus that this was a good thing. So we thought, well, by next spring, people, no matter what happens, will be thinking about and want to know more about Afghanistan. That has now happened. I assume many of you will have seen the announcements from President Obama that a new influx of American troops is underway. At least 17,000 more are being added. More will come at beyond that if necessary. And there are new debates about whether this is a good idea after all, what they should do once they arrive, and of particular interest to all of our speakers today, how their arrival might fit into pre-existing relationships, histories, and networks already on the ground in and within Afghanistan. Now, in the United States, much of this is seen understandably through that lens of Iraq. President Obama himself has suggested that many of the lessons taken to have been learned there might be applied in Afghanistan. He said so last weekend. But of course, Afghanistan is not Iraq. We invited the three best people we thought qualified to serve as guides to these issues. They all accepted. This is, this is amazing for someone doing programming. They all accepted, and they're all with us today. I'm going to introduce them collectively in alphabetical order, and then we'll ask them each to speak briefly about the issues they want to put on the table as the most important to consider in making sense of Afghanistan today, just for 20 minutes each. I will remind them of that time constraint. If any, succumb to our professional hazard of loquacity. Um, that, will be my, that will be my job. Um, because we want to have time for general discussion thereafter. And that can go at least until 6 PM or maybe a bit later. If you need to leave beforehand, I simply ask that you do so quietly. David Edwards, seated closest to me, is the W. Van Allen Clark class of 41, third century professor of the social sciences in the Department of Anthropology and Sociology at Williams College. He is also an alum, go blue, with a PhD earned in anthropology here. He has written two important books on the intersection of culture and politics in Afghanistan, exploring the emergence of a moral incoherence at the heart of the Afghan state. He's also more recently produced a major documentary film on post-Taliban Afghanistan. He's now working on an ethnography of the US Army's human terrain teams and other US counterinsurgency work, which he will discuss today. Alessandro Mansuti, seated at the opposite end of the table, is currently a research fellow at Yale University. He's usually a social anthropologist at the Graduate Institute of International and Development Studies in Geneva, Switzerland. 
He has explored with remarkable sensitivity the world of Afghanistan's main Shia minority, that's the Hazara, and has written a book that highlights their connections with a wider Muslim world, particularly through the use of informal financial transactions and uh, networks that reach far beyond the frontier and more generally about questions of diasporas and refugees. And he's currently focused on other sorts of transnational connections via the politics and practices of international reconstruction aid. And he'll be talking about that today. Finally, Nazif Shahrani in the middle of the table here is professor of anthropology and chair of the Department of Near Eastern Languages and Cultures at Indiana University Bloomington, which is a premier center for the study of Central Asian languages and cultures, one that has benefited many of our students as well. Born in Badakhshan, he too has written widely about Afghan society and culture with a particular sensitivity to the concerns and the perspectives of non-Pashtun communities within that state. His work has highlighted, I would say, the ways in which Afghan leaders have claimed to seek and work to build a unitary integral state, but how these efforts often backfire by disproportionately advantaging other particular groups. He will speak in the middle of our sequence today about I t his uh, presentation is called What Went Wrong and Why in Post-Taliban Afghanistan. So together, all of these speakers cover nearly the entire social and cultural landscape of Afghanistan. And I am delighted to have them with us, and we will proceed in the order listed on the announcement, the poster, which many of you have seen. That is first David Edwards, then Nazif Shahrani, then Alessandra Mansuti for 20 minutes each. Um, and I will begin with David Edwards, whose presentation is called Slip Sliding Away, Navigating the Human Terrain of Counterinsurgency Operations. Professor Edwards. Thank you, Doug. It's, it's, uh, Doug has uh, kindly brought me back to my alma mater several times, and I appreciate it. It's always got great to come back to, to Ann Arbor, um, where I spent uh, more years than I probably should have as a graduate student. Um, as Doug mentioned, um, it's a, it, it is an auspicious time, an important time to be talking about Afghanistan. Um, President Obama, as you all know, as Doug mentioned, has authorized um, the sending of uh, 17,000 more troops to Afghanistan. 8,000 Marines, followed by an Army Brigade of four to 5,000, along with, with uh, support troops. Um, this may be if, if um, uh, depending on the outcome of a, of a review that President Obama has, has commissioned, um, it may be the beginning of a, of a further increase of a, of a something like a surge, although I use that word cautiously, um, but a, a surge that would uh, try to change the, the momentum and the, 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 the current state of affairs in Afghanistan. Um, it's an important move, and, and it's, it's also a, 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 an interesting uh, fact that he would choose to do this so soon after uh, taking over the presidency um, in the midst of a financial crisis that's otherwise occupying his administration and also one that goes contrary to the received wisdom of so many people who are cautious, including very, very senior um, uh, policy analysts and observers who say that this war is unwinnable, that there is no strategic vision, that there is no reason for America to, to be there, that this could be the quagmire that sinks the Obama administration before it's even gotten off the ground. Clearly, the president feels otherwise, and uh, one can argue whether he or not um, this move was precipitated by the fact that he had made a, uh, a campaign pledges to to uh, to uh, maintain a commitment in Afghanistan, maybe to show that as a Democrat he was not the wimp that he was being portrayed um, by the opposition. But I think that it's clear, whatever his reasons for doing so, and we'll find a better, uh, hopefully we'll find a better, uh, have a better understanding of that when the review comes out that's been commissioned. But it's clear that President Obama has been willing to stake his presidency on the outcome of, of a situation in Afghanistan that is um, contentious and that uh, has been um, a place where many other um, uh, people who have tried to solve the problems there have failed. So it's, it, the stakes couldn't be higher. Um, it couldn't be higher not only for the Afghan people but for the American people and the international community as well. 
What the troops face in Afghanistan is a, is a, um, a, a murky situation. Um, we've come to, 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 uh, to believe and to, to um, understand that the biggest problems um, that uh, the troops, the coalition forces in Afghanistan face have been in the southern and eastern parts of the country, the so-called Pashtun belt. Um, but now the, the, the uh, fractious and dangerous areas of Afghanistan have, have come even closer um, to the capital of Kabul, um, including Wardak and Logar provinces, which are both neighboring uh, to Kabul and where, according to some reports, um, nearly half of the districts may be outside of government control, where parallel governments exist. Um, that um, um, uh, provide a, a, an alternative administration to that of the, of the government itself. Um, at the same time, while the threat is greater and more proximate and closer to the capital, I think it would also be inaccurate to say that this re represents the resurrection of the Taliban um, or that it demonstrates their universal popularity in Afghanistan. I think that that's not at all the case. If the Taliban enjoy any popularity, is probably in the single digits. It's it, although that that kind of calculation of of, of sort of a polling of a thinking doesn't really operate very well in Afghanistan. But I think you can see from the the kinds of operations that the Taliban is undertaking, IED strikes, suicide bombings. Um, there are once uh, they, they, at one time, and, and on one, the one hand, they show the adoption of Iraqi-style urban um, insurgency tactics that have been borrowed from Iraq. They've been taken fr from that from that um, uh, uh, situation, but they also, I think, show the inability of, of the Taliban to directly confront, or their hesitance to directly confront coalition forces in direct attacks. Such direct attacks have been relatively rare much rarer, for example, than Mujahideen attacks were, than what the Mujahideen were able to do during the 1980s against the Soviet Union. I think if international forces withdrew, the Taliban would not drive uncontested into Kabul and take over the government. They would be unable or be, find it very difficult to be able to form an administration. A more likely scenario would be one in which Afghanistan would slowly degenerate into tribal conflicts as the central government becomes increasingly irrelevant to the country as a whole. Clearly, and this is what we're waiting to hear from the, the, um, from the president, clearly one thing that is needed is a uh, a strategic vision for why we're in Afghanistan. It's a strategic vision that the troops in Afghanistan need and the leadership of the troops in Afgan Afghanistan need to inform why it is that they're there and what their priorities should be. But it's also a vision that the population, that our public needs as well to explain to the people of America, to Afghanistan and to the international community as a whole, why we're there, what we hope to accomplish and what the framework of that um, the time uh, framework of that um, mission might be. There are clear aspects of that, of that strategy, strategic vision that need to be encompassed within the document that's produced by the commission. We need a coherent approach to reconstruction, the provision of economic security to the people of Afghanistan. We need government reform that focuses in particular on the problem of corruption, and we need a coordinated diplomatic and political response approach that encompasses Pakistan, Iran, and Afghanistan, all three of the major regional players. All three of these things are important. The, the aspect of, the, of the, the strategic vision that I want to focus on today, however, is specifically counterinsurgency, how we mm, are, are to um, approach the whole issue of counterinsurgency in Afghanistan, how we intend to respond to the threat represented by the Taliban and al-Qaeda. Um, this is an area that I've gotten interested in recently. I'm not a military specialist. I've been a, a student of Afghan, Afghan culture for my career, Afghan culture, religion, history. Um, like Nazif and, and Alessandro, um, one thing that Doug didn't mention is all three of us are anthropologists. We all come out of, that, of, of a background of doing uh, ethnographic research. Um, that's our commitment. And so for me, um, I'm actually branching out quite a bit recently in, in one sense in that I've gotten interested in, in U.S. military culture and the way in which we're approaching the war in Afghanistan. But I do so, again, as an, as an ethnologist, as an ethnographer, as an anthropologist. What got me interested in this issue of the U.S. military and how it's approaching the war in Afghanistan is first my concern over the last few years um, about the failure of our efforts in Afghanistan. 
particularly the civilian casualties that were so detrimental to the efforts of the, of the U.S. and the Afghan government to bring about stability in the country, but also civilian casualties that were so tragic in their own right. And I also got interested in the, in the role of the military because of a controversy that some of you may have heard about um, within anthropology, uh, which had to do with the human terrain systems, the HTS program that the Army had um, and, and a few years ago began, initiated to uh, bring social scientists, including anthropologists, into um, uh, the military zones, into combat uh, areas, areas of operation which created uh, this program which we intended to bring, um, although very, in, in fact very few anthropologists are actually involved, um, it, it, it created a, a major uh, turmoil and controversy within anthropology. Now, I was naturally interested in this because of my interest in Afghanistan and my, and my more ambivalent feelings about um, social science's potential contribution to the war in Afghanistan. But one of the things that I, I was particularly disturbed about as an anthropologist was how the people who were critical of the program um, knew so little bit knew so little about it, and how they were making judgments about the um, the, the the efficacy, the the ethical um, status of the program without actually ever having really looked into what the program was all about. I have found in I have found in my own research that the problem is the program is problematic. But I was uh, disturbed that that as scientists we were acting so unscientifically, so polemically in our in our uh, approach to uh, the HTS program. And what I found as I looked more into it was that there was actually much more interesting questions uh, that associated with the, the human terrain program than the ones that the, the anthropology community was focusing on, including. Uh, the, the existence, the, to my mind, w w something that I really knew very little of, about, and, and that was the existence in this country of a vast network of universities, colleges, research institutes that were all funded by the Pentagon and that were all dedicated to educating officers and soldiers, training them in various ways for their, to, uh, to, to um, fulfill their mission as officers, as soldiers within the U.S. military. Um, that there is really a parallel academic universe that very few of us in the um, uh, research institutions like the University of Michigan or Williams College where I teach are, are even aware of. I was also really interested in the fact that, um, that while we were concerned with what the military might do to anthropology, the way in which anthro the military might uh, what they call uh, weaponize culture, uh, a term that was used sometimes in the, in the, in the polemical charges against HES. What I was also interested in the ways in which anthropology might humanize the military. And in per, importantly, the ways in which the military might um, be, ch be challenged in the very nature of its, of its orientation and the training in particular of the military might be challenged. An orientation that primarily um, is oriented toward creating warriors, uh, uh, to creating a warrior culture um, um, to, in a sense, doing the exact opposite of what anthropology does, which is essentially uh, an operation of empathy. Anthropology is essentially, essentially about learning to come to terms with other people's points of view, understanding the world as other people see it. And so much of the military really is not about that. So much of the military is about being, teaching young men to, um, to be able to pull a trigger and to kill another person before that other person could kill him or his comrades, him or his or her comrades. Um, so I found that, that there's a fundamental um, uh, 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 problem, an issue here that I think is really pr profoundly interesting and that I began to see as I, as I began to investigate, particularly the training programs that the military has instituted, um, to teach culture, to teach local cultures, to teach soldiers how to deal with the nuances of, of the places where they're operating. I, 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 I found a, a fascinating set of problems. Um, my work so far has involved going to the, U the HTS training uh, center at Fort Leavenworth, spending time there at uh, the uh, Marine Corps Intelligence Activities Unit and their Center for Advanced uh, Operational Cultural Learning, the Marines at, at Quantico, Virginia. To, and, and, and as well as looking at interviewing um, um, military officers who are involved in training, as well as working with HTS. 
Um, and also looking at how coin operations, counterinsurgency operations are also being transformed by an, uh, an appreciation, understanding of culture in other coalition countries, including the Czech Republic and the Netherlands. Um, in evaluating, so I, I wanted, that's just to give you a bit of background. I want now to, to turn to trying to understand counterinsurgency or coin strategy, past, present, and future in Afghanistan. In evaluating the future of coin strategy in Afghanistan, it's worth first to consider where it has been. And for the purposes of this talk, I, I want to rely on an account by General David Barno, who was in charge of the coalition operations in Afghanistan from 2003 to 2005. His account appeared in the September-October 2007 issue of Military Review. The thrust of his argument, let's see if I can, the thrust of General Barno's argument is that there was during his watch, and keep in mind that he was in charge during this period, and so there's a self-serving aspect of his account, a justification and an appreciation of his accomplishments. But the thrust of his account was that there was, in fact, a successful counterinsurgency strategy in Afghanistan. It, it um, was the um, uh, operative uh, strategy from, 19, from 2003 to 2005. It worked at the time and subsequently has been abandoned, and that our s failures in Afghanistan, the problems we've encountered, were not that because Afghanistan was unmanageable, ungovernable, but rather because we moved away from a coin strategy that was working. Now, in the, I, I don't have, um, unfortunately, I'm not, one of the things I've discovered about the military is that they are really, really good at PowerPoint presentations. And PowerPoint presentations, along with acronyms, are the, are the kind of the, the fuel of military culture. And I, I'm afraid even to, I, I'm embarrassed when I, when I talk in to, to military audiences because my PowerPoint presentations are so feeble. But... Uh, because when, when you see General Barno's version of this, what you see is actually a Greek temple, and the General Barno's overarching principles are the roof and cross beams of the, of the Greek temple, and there are five pillars that support this roof and cross beams, and then there's a foundation underneath. So I have, I was also traveling, so I wasn't able to even try to put together a Greek temple, but so imagine this is a Greek temple and this is the roof. These are the two overarching principles, the roof of the Greek temple of, of General Barno's um, uh, analysis of uh, counterinsurgency. And the two, are, the two critical um, um, uh, operating princi principles that he focuses on are first the principle that the people are the center of gravity in any counterinsurgency operation. This is an idea that is familiar to many of you now. It's become familiar because it's become associated in the media with General Petraeus, with the uh, success, recent success of the surge in Afghanistan. Um, I think one of the reasons, one of the things, one of maybe General Barno's uh, missions in publishing his account was to also show that David Petraeus did not invent counterinsurgency. Um, but he w would argue that this was already an, an operative principle, that he too was able to read some of the classic uh, manuals and texts of counterinsurgency, and that he, under his administration, had already moved away from kinetic operations for a focus on military uh, violent um, uh, uh, operations in which the enemy was the center of gravity and moved instead to a, a, a principle that it is the people supporting the people, gaining the support of the people that is what has to be the, the meat and potatoes, the bread and butter of any counterinsurgency operation. The second of the cross beams of the, or the, of, the, of the overarching principles of General Barno is the idea of unity of purpose. And here he is both a soldier and also a bureaucrat, which any top-ranking soldier in the military has to be, an army in particular, managing a vast uh, uh, hierarchy, a vast um, 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 bureaucracy. And, and one of the, 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 the uh, central pieces of his account was the way in which most of his activity, or a great deal of his activity when he was in charge of the operation in Afghanistan was oriented toward rationalizing an irrational structure, rationalizing a bureaucracy that was, had uh, uh, chains of command that were crisscrossing, overlapping, and, and, and confusing, and trying to create, um, through bureaucratic means, a unity of purpose which would m put everybody both on the same page and also with the same, uh, same purpose. Um, among the 
I mentioned that there were five pillars in this Greek temple. Here are the, the five pillars plus one. This is at the bottom of, 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 of his temple. And these are the, the, the principles that he, that guides his, his um, um, uh, guided his uh, um, uh, approach to counterinsurgency during his administration, during his command. Defeat terrorism and deny sanctuary, enable Afghan security forces so that ultimately the job of providing security for the Afghan people could be turned over to indigenous forces. Sustain area ownership, by which he meant um, make sure that brigade commanders and others who were in charge of, of areas of res had areas of responsibility in Afghanistan were in charge of the entire area. Everything that happened within their region was under their authority, under their command, uh, which was very different than what existed prior to that, where you had overlapping, confusing chains of command. Uh, enable reconstruction and good governance, providing again through through uh, the provision primarily of security, um, and engage regional states. Those were the five pillars that that he um, uh, envisioned as uh, central to his approach to to to, um, um, to counterinsurgency. And then at the bottom of his Greek temple, information operations. I personally would have put information on operations at the top, like the roof protecting uh, the temple, but he put it at the bottom. And, but the recognition there was that without public relations, without an effective mechanism for, um, for conveying your intentions, your accomplishments, and also explaining problems, um, including civilian casualties, you were forever at the mercy of, of um, you were forever at the mercy of the Taliban, who, want th who have consistently been able to run circles around coalition forces in terms of their use of, of, of information. Um, since I've already been told that I have little time, uh, I, I want to um, jump ahead. Um, General Barnow um, indicated that during the time um, that he was in command, counterinsurgency worked, and one of the reasons was a unity of purpose. At that time, the unity of purpose, the strategic vision was clearer than it is now, and one reason was that the focus of op American operations in Afghanistan was centered on um, creating a constitution or a enabling the Afghans to create a constitution and holding presidential and parliamentary elections. Those were discrete, discernible tasks that the military focused on. Their operations were centered around making sure that those um, processes, those electoral processes, were able to take place. Whether or not it was a good idea for those processes to be foregrounded the way that we decided to is, is debatable. I personally think that, that it, it was too soon, that, that, that there was too much emphasis upon democracy as an end in itself. That, that the Bush administration found democracy in elections as a way to do uh, nation building on the cheap and a way to, 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 to create a mission, in, a mission accomplished scenario w w in which they could get out. Um, but nevertheless, from the point of view of, view of the military command, it, it provided them a unity of purpose, both a, a, a central uh, a str a strategy that was um, able to guide their um, the decisions and operations that they were on, that they undertook during that period of time. Since 2005, progress has been derailed, and Barno cites ten principal factors for the unraveling of counterinsurgency. And I'll just go over these quickly. Um, some were. Um, had less to do with our mistakes or decisions and uh, that were situation circumstantial, one of which was the ability of the of, uh, Taliban and Al Qaeda to respond to to change their tactics and particularly to adopt ta uh, tactics that were taken from um, from Iraq, including the use of IEDs and suicide bombings which which have increased as you all know dramatically in the last few years. Um, a second um, factor that he that he uh, gives great attention to is the sus suspension at that time. This article was written in 2007. Since that time, cross-border operations against uh, within the the, the um, tribal areas on the Pakistan border have have increased again. But at that point, he was particularly concerned with the absence of uh, cross-border operations, which gave safe safe haven and sanctuary to Taliban forces and Al Qaeda forces across the Pakistan border. Same problem that the Soviets, of course, faced in the 1980s. 
Um, a third um, a reason that he, that he gives for the, the um, um, failure of, of, of counterinsurgency after 2005 is a rely, over-reliance on technical military remedies, in a sense to roll back the idea that the people are the center of gravity and to emphasize both technological solutions and force protection, um, the, the number of the fourth point, um, the, for, the, the, the force protection of U.S. troops as opposed to the protection of the population. Population. His point and the point that Petraeus and other p advocates of current counterinsurgency um, strategy point uh, to is that troops are actually a great deal safer when they are in the villages, when they are among the people, and not when that they are sequestered behind um, razor wire and, and concrete walls in their forward operating bases, where they have limited understanding of the terrain, of the human or physical terrain, where they are actually more vulnerable because when they come out, it's into a hostile terror territory that they have no information about, no access to information about, and particularly vulnerable to IED strikes. And IED strikes have, um, have again, have, have um, be become the, the major weapon that the Taliban um, use. Um, also, and the other aspect of this over-reliance on technical and military rel remedies, of course, is the, the use of close air support, um, which has brought about a massive increase of the use of munitions, of large-scale munitions, and, uh, and um, uh, the, the collateral damage, the, the civilian casualties that have also resulted, sometimes uh, playing directly into the hands of the Taliban who are willing to use civilians um, as, as uh, weapons in the information war against the, the U.S. and the Afghan government. Um, a, a fifth point that he makes is that the U.S. in 2005 ceded control of the operations in Afghanistan to NATO. And this has to do, the, 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 the sin here from Barno's point of view was that it, while it, 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 decree, it, it increased the, the, the network of, of, uh, of nations involved in Afghan operations and distributed the responsibility to our uh, coalition partners, it also created bureaucratic havoc, um, cross-cutting uh, cross lines of communication and command that ultimately undermined, has undermined and done more harm than good. This, you, you can argue that, 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 that along with, uh, that there may be a, a, a rational a reason for his concern with U.S. ceding command to NATO, but there's also probably as well um, the other issues in his mind too, including the idea the, of U.S. forces under non-U.S. command has always been a difficult one for U.S. military leaders to stomach. But I think the, the case he makes is, is a convincing one that the, the, the turning over to NATO had did, created more harm than good. Uh, the sixth reason th that he um, cites for the failure of counterinsurgency operations was the announcement of troop reductions by the United States, not the troop reductions themselves, but the announcement and how that played into the information operations and how it undermined Afghan confidence in the long-term commitment of the U.S. to staying the course and helping to produce a, st uh, a stable situation in their country. Seventh was the turnover in senior leadership. Again, another problem in bureaucracies where you have a, a continual turnover of top diplomatic, of State Department and military officials, and the, the confusion that that brings about. Eighth point he makes is the broken chains of command. The, the idea of area ownership, which he had emphasized, was also broken because br brigade commanders often um, did not um, uh, have clear cl chains of authority. That sometimes they were they were connected to NATO, sometimes to U.S. military chains of command. Uh, uh, PRT, the provincial reconstruction operations, the, the PRTs, the provincial reconstruction teams operating in different provinces, which were supposed to integrate military and economic and civil uh, civil operations into coordinated programs were on uh, uh, answering to different chains of command in the military so you had situations of complete chaos which is very much the case so area ownership and the breakdown of, of, of bre breakdown of area ownership and chains of command was another essential problem that he saw starting in 2005 the ninth was increased government corruption, something that we, we uh, don't need to get into right now. But finally, it, the absence of an, a comprehensive strategy, something that we hope will, will um, uh, come about now that the, the um, um, Obama administration is about to take, um, um, 
now that the, the Obama administration has promised that they will have a, a document that provides a strategic vision for Afghanistan. Um, I, I just want to wrap up now. Um, um, well, I guess the, I, I'll just wrap up by saying that th these are some of the problems um, that um, that Barno uh, addresses, and I think that we can uh, we can I can discuss afterwards um, in, in the question and answer some of the the uh, implications of this for what we need where we need to go in the future. But some of them are obvious, and and I and I think that w however self-serving Barno's account is, um, it still provides um, uh, some guidelines for what we need to have in counterinsurgency operations in Afghanistan including an adoption of a coherent, unified, population-centered uh, uh, coin strategy, getting troops out of their bases into villages where they are actually more secure because they are involved with people, have access to information. Right now, the forces are uh, confined to bases where they have limited contact with, with Afghan civilian population. Even if people were sympathetic to the uh, U.S. troops, how would they get information to them? What opportunities do they have to provide information about um, the uh, planting of IEDs or the, the um, infiltration of Taliban units into their village? Right now, the, the, by isolating themselves, Ironically, the troops have made themselves more vulnerable. Um, more troops, I think, the, 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 personally, the, the Obama's decision to bring in more troops, while it was the right way to go, but I, it may not be enough. It may be all that he can, we can actually afford, given the, li the, the limits of, of, uh, of, um, uh, of our, uh, that, are, that are on our military right now, the way in which they've been overpressed. But I think that in order to, for effective counterinsurgency operations to take place, it's vital that there be a, a sufficient density of troops that they actually be able to um, um, operate uh, uh, effectively. We'll never get to the optimum ratio of 20 troops per every thousand, which um, um, uh, uh, coin strategy it, um, um, dictates, but we can at least provide uh, through a surge, through additional troops right now, a better opportunity, a chance for um, training to take place, to better train, equip, and employ uh, indigenous Afghan forces in both the, the army and in, 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 in the police. Um, and I'll, I'll wrap up there, and, and we can uh, continue the discussion later. Our next speaker is Nazif Shahrani, who will be uh, speaking on what went wrong in post-Taliban Afghanistan and why. Assalamu alaikum and good evening. Let me uh, thank Doug for uh, the invitation and for many of my good friends for showing up here. Uh, obviously, the Afghanistan issue uh, probably has many pillars than five that General Barno has uh, identified. Uh, I'm not going to cover uh, the ground that <coughs> David did, but I'll focus on some of the pillars that have been mentioned, in particular, the problem of uh, state building in Afghanistan, and particularly uh, the attempt on the part of the uh, Bush administration and now in the challenge for uh, Obama administration to build a state. And of course, we're hearing also a bunch of other things about uh, what's happening with that particular government. Uh, the concept of failed state, fragile state, has become an industry of sorts. There are lots of books, lots of articles being written these days. Uh, this one says the complex phenomena of modern nation states and their failure may be much discussed, but it remains uh, little understood. And it's not just Afghanistan. There are, in fact, uh, the uh, index of failed states, if you look at them, uh, it actually has uh, close to at least one third of all the states around the world who fit that particular category. So Afghanistan is not unique, or what we are seeing in Afghanistan is not unique. It's, it's a common problem in the third world post-colonial, particularly multi-ethnic societies. The second one comes from our own General Petros, and it was uh, uttered in uh, the Munich Security Conference on the 8th of February. And I think it's uh, uh, obviously some indicator of maybe the direction 
that uh, Obama administration is headed. And he's saying, uh, really, the issue here is legitimacy, that government in Afghanistan uh, has not enjoyed legitimacy. In fact, it has lost the uh, legitimacy that perhaps people had offered it early on in, in a few years. And the reason for that, of course, as he says, is uh, uh, corruption, and that uh, there is indeed, uh, Obama recently also mentioned, that there seemed to be a gap between the elite who are ruling Afghanistan and the people. Uh, the gravity that uh, General Barno is talking about, the gravity should be on people, in fact, has not been on the people at all. And that may be this, this gap that exists between the two is very important one. Um, where are we? One other uh, important, uh, I think, indicator that I've recently heard comes from Senator Lieberman. And Senator Lieberman's point is, uh, was made on, uh, before General Petros, actually, at uh, Brookings Institution on the 29th of January. Uh, he is also talking about the fact that uh, the government of Afghanistan is illegitimate and it's, there is a lot of corruption. But the point I think he's making is that you cannot solve the problem of corruption by blaming Karzai or anyone else on ad hoc basis, that it is a systemic problem and that it requires a systemic response. And that's uh, hopefully where I'm headed, as to what, in fact, is the problem with the system that breeds corruption in Afghanistan, and how can one address that so that uh, that problem uh, hopefully will not be with us for, for too long. There is one uh, other one. This one comes actually from a book, uh, Seth Kaplan's book, Fixing Fragile States. Uh, a recent book, uh, last year's book, where he is talking about uh, if states are to be successful, he says there has to be a relationship between the state and the people in the local conditions. And if, if the, the particular kind of state structure is not appropriate for a particular context, culturally, socially, economically, politically, and otherwise, uh, it's bound to fail. And perhaps that's, that's indeed what has happened. Now, let me um, just go is to the whole issue of what went wrong. What went wrong in Afghanistan began with the Bonn Conference. Most of you know that uh, in December of 2001, after we had started the campaign and, and Taliban were about to fizzle out and at least leave Kabul and, and go to other places, there was a conference in Bonn that brought four groups of elite uh, of Afghanistan together, and they came up. They not so much, they, it really was uh, two, three Afghan elites who were serving as special advisor to Lakhdar Brahimi of the United Nations, and that they cooked up uh, a particular kind of uh, agenda for Afghanistan, and some assumptions were made at that conference, which really laid uh, the foundation for the kind of policy that was pursued over the last eight years and policies that obviously have failed. And unless and until one questions those assumptions on the basis of which the, the policies were uh, organized, there is no hope of correcting the policy as such. And that's what I hope President Obama and his team would be doing, uh, that is, uh, questioning some of those fundamental assumptions. First of all, it's important to identify what they are, what they were, whether they are, uh, in fact, going on that, on that direction or not. The first and foremost uh, uh, point about the kind of assumption that they made in deciding what to do in Bonn was that Pakistan and the Pashtun elite who went from Washington with uh, Lakhdar Brahimi and others, said the reason for the war in Afghanistan and the rise of Taliban, all that was because the Pashtun were discontent with the political conditions after uh, 1992. In 1992, they lost basically uh, being the dominant political uh, ethnic group in Afghanistan that they had been ruling with one brief intermission of, uh, inter, uh, uh, mission, mission of uh, uh, 1929, they had been ruling the country from 1747 until 1992. 
in one form or another. And that the fact that they lost, so the rise of Taliban was really a political movement uh, and less religious. Religion was a camouflage, cover, ration, rationalization, whatever the case may have been. So the idea was certainly they are not a good lot. They have gone to the extreme. Some of the same uh, elite who actually were in Bonn, the Pashtun ones, were supporting Taliban earlier on. Uh, and only later they sort of withdrew because they became too extremist, in, in, uh, particularly regarding women and some uh, horrible things, the, the uh, uh, implementation of the so-called the harsh hudud law within Islam, which meant uh, stoning the woman and cutting hands of thieves and all that sort of stuff. So the assumption was if you could get the Pashtuns back in the seat of power. And of course, in this instance, those elite who were uh, joining uh, the United States and the coalition force. And they, just like the Iraqi elite who went with us initially, promised, you know, uh, people will be with us. You just, just get rid of the Taliban, put us in power, and the Pashtun will be with us, and everything will be just fine. And of course, that did not happen. Uh, the Pashtun did not side with the current elite, not with Karzai, not with his uh, uh, cohorts who have been in, in, uh, in the country, they initially had some doubts, the populace, but eventually began to uh, turn back to uh, supporting the Taliban as they have. Indeed, it, in uh, Bonn, the first, one of the first uh, moves that uh, was made was to reestablish monarchy in Afghanistan. That the, we, the United States of America, in fact, supported the reinstitution of monarchy, and they wanted King Zahir to go back. And it was the Mujahideen in Kabul who said, no, we will not accept the return of the monarchy. And at that point, there was an election by, the, by those uh, 16, 17 people who were there uh, as to who should be the leader of the country. Not surprisingly, uh, no, uh, the choice was not Hamid Karzai. He had won three votes only. And another person who was a monarchist but happened to be of Uzbek ethnic group member, had won 13 votes. And the assumption was you cannot have a non-Pashtun lead Afghanistan, so uh, they basically sidelined him, and he's sitting in San Diego, has been there for, for some time. And uh, Hamid Karzai became uh, the uh, choice for the, for the country to be, to be led. The issue in Afghanistan, and I think for us in the United States, always has been who should lead Afghanistan. This has been who can and who should. And so that once you answer that question, well, traditionally it has been one ethnic group. It has to be the same. Nobody else will accept anyone else. And it's just like we used to think, you know, a black in America cannot be a president of the United States. And yet, uh, we have now a president. I hope that it'll break the ice in other places so that it's, it's, it's not a monopoly of, at least in principle, it shouldn't be a monopoly of anybody, <coughs> any one ethnic group. And in Afghanistan, it has been. And that we keep, right now there is another election coming up in Afghanistan. The biggest question being asked is, who will be the next president of Afghanistan? Will Hamid Karzai will win? And interestingly enough, just like uh, General Barno, who is giving himself, uh, vindicating himself that when he was there, everything was going just fine. Counter uh, insurgency was working. Only after he left, someone else can, came and changed the things, and that's what the problem is. Surprise, surprise, we have two, three candidates for presidency of Afghanistan. But these are people who were in Bonn, who have served in the cabinet, so one of them at least until a few weeks ago. And now they're saying uh, Hamid Karzai could not do it, but the system is fine, and you just elect me or back me up and I'll fix it. This is not a problem that can be fixed by a leader. The, the issue in Afghanistan has not been who should lead Afghanistan, but how Afghanistan should be governed. And that issue has not been raised at all. The other, uh, so ultimately what happened is in the last eight years, what we have done is basically reconstructed politically the Afghan state before the war of 1978. It, the constitution, by the way, in Bonn for uh, interim period that they adopted was the constitution of monarchy that had been put together in 1964 
one of the supposedly more liberal constitutions in the Middle East at the time, and so on and so forth. And when you compare that constitution with the constitution that was adopted in 2004, uh, in fact, the king had less rights in the constitution of 1964 than the president has in the current constitution. And the system otherwise is not any dif uh, anything different. And people, in fact, who were brought in to fill the cabinets and, and so on were uh, some of the same people who had served in the monarchy era in maybe in the middle ranks, maybe some of them even in the higher ranks who refilled the whole position. And I should uh, qualify here. The person who was the head of drafting that constitution was my cousin. Okay? But he was used. And he knows it, that much of what went in the Constitution was ordered. And I have at least two letters of orders. Not, did not come from my cousin. Someone else provided me with Ahmed Karzai's signature, ordering the commission that such and such thing should be included in the Constitution, his article, this or that. So, and that, or in fact, that Constitution draft that was put together by the commission had been given to Hamid Karzai for, to basically review and then be allowed to distribute it. He kept it for two months, and the Constitution was essentially rewritten. Chapters were uh, taken out of the uh, 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 draft. So it's not the, the work of the commission, independent commission, that supposedly was, was putting it together, but something that uh, happened uh, with, again, uh, the approval of uh, uh, Karzai and his team, uh, and essentially what we ended up was uh, to reconstitute the same old system. Uh, and what was the old system? Where are some of the key issues? The political culture, in my judgment, the real problem lies in the political culture of Afghan state. And those, again, has some basic pillars on which it has been built, and that it, the, the cracks of the entire problem of state building in Afghanistan lies on, on how this political culture has operated and has come to operate again in the new environment uh, in Afghanistan. The first and foremost, of course, in this is uh, the, the uh, principle of kingship, which uh, David has also in one of his earlier books talked about. This is a principle that's based on uh, the idea or notion of sovereignty that the king is sovereign, and he can do anything and everything he wants. One of the things that the king does, of course, is appoint everybody, from uh, ministers all the way to clerks at the local level, has to be approved either directly or indirectly by the monarch, by the king. It is utterly person-centered politics. It's the person of the king. It's not the institution. It's not the system, nothing. It's, it's a person-centered uh, problem. And the other thing, of course, is cobble-centered, that everything has to take place in the capital city, and everything is in capital, and it emanates from here, and there is nothing that anybody can uh, do. And of course, this becomes the plum over which everybody fights. Why, uh, in 19, between 92 and 96, everybody came to Kabul to take Kabul and destroy in the process the whole city and turn it into rubble. Because again, the power center is supposed to be Kabul, and if you take Kabul, you have it, you have everything, and, and that's where and the sovereignty rules and so on goes with that. The second very important um, part of the political culture of Afghanistan, certainly at the, at the uh, ruling level as well as at the local levels, is kinship, which has to do with tribe, with politicization of identities of all, all sorts. And it goes back to the first principle, the principle of kinship. That is, when king makes an appointment, the first principle is kinship. You uh, appoint your own kinsman. So the principle of nepotism is part and parcel of the political culture. And when you run out of them, you buy minorities and anyone else who is willing to, to be not so much bought is rented. In Afghanistan, you can't buy people, but you can rent them easily. They're available for rent. It, it was said a long time ago. And of course, here, cronyism. 
And Lagan Bardarlik is, is another concept of, of people who, who basically serve the master. Uh, and uh, so you have client, uh, 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 client and, and uh, patron relationships here rather than anything else. There is no partnership. There is client uh, relationship, and, and people do that. And uh, to, to sort of go back to my cousin, my cousin ended up having a ministry. He was vice president, later on became minister, and just a few days ago he was relieved of his duties from his ministry, but his son has become a minister of something else. <laughs> so it, 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 the, this is a very, very um, serious matter. When you run out of kinsmen and cronies, then you sell them. You sell the offices. Corruption in this system is such that right now being a commander of a district officer, a police commander, is $100,000. And if you pay $100,000 and you go to take a post someplace, you have to multiply that. Because you have paid already uh, the price. Now you have to you know, collect the interest on that. So the system itself, the, the political culture itself, breeds the problem that we're, we're, we're faced with. The, the third one is Islam. Islam has been, again, uh, a, a phenomena that really uh, either brings people in government together or separates them. For political elite in Afghanistan, Islam has been an instrument for either legitimizing their political uh, policies or whipping people with it. In other words, there, there, there has been very little commitment in the actual uh, uh, values of Islam by those who govern Muslim societies. And the difference is that for people, Islam truly is a devotional religion in a system of guidance for their daily lives. Something that does not happen in politics. It does not, neither the politicians nor the, nor the state, in fact, uh, has commitment of using religion as a devotional uh, uh, phenomena or uh, guide their policies and their conduct on the basis of values of that religion. And that's where the gaps come from. And of course, what also has been missed by those who return to Afghanistan after 30 years of living in Europe or in America to uh, take the elite uh, positions is that they did not realize in the 30 years because of the jihad against the Soviet Union and later on other issues and, and what had happened in between the people, particularly Pashtun, who constituted 85% of all the refugees in Pakistan had become far more conservative and aware of Islam far more than they were before, had more knowledge of Islam, but a very conservative version of that, which of course was again, it came through the uh, madrasas that uh, uh, Saudis and others uh, built and so on and so forth. So that this gap has been tremendous between the elite who are ruling Afghanistan today and uh, uh, the ordinary people. And I've asked uh, my Pashtun friends in Kabul, but you know, we were told the Pashtuns were out of power. Now they have come back to power. They have filled all the key uh, ministries and so on and so forth. So what's the problem? He says, when you look at from the village point of village Pashtuns point of view, they see somebody speaking Pashtun, but they don't see a Muslim in those people. And much to the credit of Karzai, Karzai himself personally is considered to be a pious person, but not his cabinet members, not a lot of others, and people take issue. So they, this gap is a, is a critical one. And the last one is the political economy of state that is in Afghanistan from the very beginning. Afghan state has depended initially in uh, the 18th century on wars in India that they led these uh, uh, tribal uh, militias basically into India for loot. And then of course when they captured, uh, the soldiers got their loot, the uh, king could collect revenues, uh, tribute and so on and so forth. That changed with the British coming into Afghanistan and that they started giving subsidies. And they started crowning. And of course the best of the crowning happened in 1880 after the second British Anglo-British War. And that phenomenon has become far more complicated, that the, the rulers in Afghanistan are dependent on outside funding, outside weapons, outside money, and that they use this to oppress their own people rather than to 
in, in uh, bring in any sort of participatory politics in the country. And th these are really the issues uh, that has not changed, that what's happening today in, in uh, Afghanistan is uh, exactly uh, the reconstitution, in, in fact, in some ways, re-strengthening of um, some of the uh, uh, things that had happened before. So the issue th that I'm not going to get find, I mean, find time to talk about is then what, what could be done to fix this mess. And uh, here I'm suggesting, uh, I think, what has been already uh, uttered by uh, Senator uh, Lieberman, that you cannot uh, basically change the regime. That is, you cannot change uh, Mr. Karzai with someone else. It wouldn't do you anything any good. That you have to change the system of governance in Afghanistan. And the only way you can do that is to introduce participatory politics at all levels. That is, uh, the, the most important principle of that is community self-governance is a principle. You know, there's a lot of talk about wanting to speak to Taliban. Nobody is telling us what they will be talking to Taliban about. What is there to talk about? The only model that has been available is, is a bond model, uh, distributing cabinet posts. This group gets five, that group gets 10, and that group gets uh, three, and so on and so forth. So you bring in Taliban and give them a few more ministries. They say, no, we don't want the ministries. We want the whole darn thing. That's what we were fighting for. So that, that's not an issue. But the other side of it is the Taliban are beginning to control districts, and maybe not yet provinces, but certainly lots of districts. And in one case, in Musaqala last year, when one of the Taliban commanders, local commanders, joined the government, what did the government do? Appoint him district officer of that district. And he became a target to be killed by Taliban. So why can't we negotiate with them uh, by adopting community self-governance and allowing Taliban to run for office at the local level, provincial level, and if they are elected, let them run those places on the basis of some kind of constitutional framework at the center. But that's, uh, and, and uh, now they're happy they're controlling some districts. Why not uh, adopt that principle? And if you do that, then you will be actually dealing with problem of corruption, politicization of ethnicity. The other thing is we have to get rid of appointments. There's lots of appointments being uh, just, uh, uh, Two more minutes, if I may. Um, if you uh, send somebody from Kabul to any place in the country, he goes there or she goes there as a ruler over subjects, especially if he has paid money to, take the, uh, to get the office. So you have really subject-ruler relationship, not government, government and civil servants. We don't have, uh, basically, uh, uh, citizens in Afghanistan. We only have subjects. The only way you can do that is allow people to elect their own political officers and create a condition where the government cannot appoint anybody, that people have to be recruited on the basis of their merit. And if, you, if people of different, different ethnic regions begin to hire other ethnic group members to come and serve them, you will begin to build trust. You will begin to have some kind of relationship between government and, and people at the center. So decentralization through, uh, uh, again, uh, adoption of community self-governance and participatory politics and so on and so forth. It also requires in Afghanistan uh, uh, you know, some kind of enumeration of the population. We don't know who, how many people really are in Afghanistan. We have never had census. They, they have not done one. It was supposed to be happening. It hasn't happened. Uh, districts are also organized in, in manners that uh, doesn't make any sense. It favors one ethnic group over other. So there are a whole lot of problems, I think, that has to do, uh, again, uh, even with the issue of uh, 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 police and security. Uh, we have been intent in building this huge army for Afghanistan of now 134,000 army and 120,000 police, and who knows how many um, tens of thousands of spies and so on and so forth. It's now costing what they have today two and a half billion dollars a year to maintain the force that they have created. And of course, uh, uh, the more force they have created, the more insecurity in the country. So what we, would have, we could have done was to have community police in community self-defense units, something that uh, Mujahideen communities from the bottom had already created during the 1980s to fight a successful war against the Soviet Union. No army in Afghanistan's history has ever defended the country. 
It's people from the local level who have organized themselves, defended their communities, liberated their, their communities. So why not do something that has worked and, and involve people in creating these, these kinds of entities instead of building this huge army, uh, uh, army and police that the country cannot sustain? By the way, uh, while the cost of maintaining the current police and uh, security force in Afghanistan is $2.5 billion, the entire budget of Afghan government last year was $960 million. Now just tell me who is going to be able to sustain any such thing. There are other alternatives, but it's not being considered. Sorry, maybe we'll get up. Our third and final speaker is Alessandro Mansuti, who will speak on the power of transnational resources in Afghanistan. For me, it's a great pleasure, I think, to be here. That's the first time in Michigan, and it's a place quite special, I think, for both Middle Eastern studies and anthropology. So, and I have some of my dearest friends who were studying here in the past, so now I can talk with them knowing the place, and that's a great pleasure indeed. And uh, obviously it's also a great pleasure to be invited among uh, David Edwards and Nazif Sharani. When I was a student, first an undergraduate and after a PhD student, I obviously read many of their books and works, uh, and I think it's a great treat for me to be uh, uh, with them. So a special day indeed. Let me start maybe to wake you up a little bit uh, by a joke, and I hope you will not take it as a provocation. But when I was uh, listening to David Edwards, I thought, wow, finally, I learned something from my father, who was a civil engineer. I learned that you cannot put the center of gravity on the, the roof of a building. It will just collapse. And apparently, General Barno didn't know, th didn't know that. So that's why I think probably I'm very pessimistic. I think we have to start acknowledging that what has been done since 2001 is a disaster. It's a total failure, and I don't think we can reform the approach. We have to invent something new. I, I'm very, very uh, pessimistic on that point. Uh, I think we lost many opportunities. We lost opportunities in the, in, in the 90s. We lost opportunity once again in 2001. So first, I studied, uh, I, I wanted to study power among Afghans, refugees. And I ended by studying transnational networks and migratory strategies. Now I'm trying to come back to power, but still keeping my transnational glasses. So somehow, I think, and that's three points I would like to share with you. The first one, I think, and that was very clear in uh, Nazif Sharani's talk, uh, the issue of Pashtun hegemony is central. I'm not saying that uh, it's central for Pashtuns and non-Pashtuns, and I think we have to address it explicitly. We have to create a platform for this debate. At the same time, and that's probably where somehow uh, I, I don't agree totally with what has been said before, I don't think the ethnic grid is adequate to understand what is going on in Afghanistan. Uh, I don't want to enter in further detail on that point, but I think in Afghanistan you have so many layers of solidarity and cooperation that you always have allies among your enemies. And that's after 30 years of war. It's quite amazing to see how little massacres, I'm very cynical now, uh, uh, happened in Afghanistan compared to other places like uh, Bosnia, Rwanda, uh, Liberia, and other places indeed. So because you had, it's a, such a fragmented country somehow that it prevented people to kill each other and to constitute big blocks. Uh, but that's not the main point I want to raise today. So that's the last one I would like to share with you. I think uh, it's the importance of resources. And uh, uh, if you want to build a state, we need many, many things. We need power, I think military power. We need coercion somehow, uh, what Max Weber was calling the legitimate uh, means of violence. But you need a, a narrative of the past, and you need resources. And these two other things totally lack, actually, in Afghanistan. Uh, they don't have a narrative, a shared narrative of the past. Is it the Pashtun country? Is it the eastern part of the Iranian world? Is it a kind of, I don't know, 
a kind of lost uh, Islamic country which resisted in the past towards Western powers? What is it after, after all? I think Afghans, they have to share something. They have to agree on what are the founding principles of this country, and they have not done it yet. Second, 93% of the national budget, which was a little bit less than 1 billion, as Nazif Sharani told us, comes from external assistance. So when a state has no revenue, how can you build legitimacy? So as long as these two aspects have not been addressed, there is absolutely no solution possible militarily or other in this country. So that's why I think it's very important to, uh, to address these issues. So now, uh, to, to, to try to m make it more visible. So my first state, I have worked among Shiite myself. And to make, ma to make things very clear, uh, many of the people I have worked with have been killed by Taliban, so I have absolutely no sympathy for them. But I think, somehow, all Afghanistan, and probably even beyond the borders of Afghanistan, you have a kind of very deep social changes. And these social changes are characterized somehow by the emergence of a new class of men who has legitimized, it has been said before, their upward mobility through Islam. I have documented it um, uh, with other colleagues among Shiites, and I think something similar is going on among Pashtuns on both sides of the border, so in Pakistan and in Afghanistan. So somehow the Taliban are the, the reflect of this very deep change. And you can see in Waziristan, for instance, in Pakistan, their first target were the tribal leaders, the tribal chiefs. So somehow they get rid of the, the, the traditional elites. So it's deeply, I think, and that's very disturbing if you want, I think deeply the Taliban are a social movement. The problem, I have worked among the Shiites, not among the Pashtuns. And I don't think it's possible now to send a PhD student among the Pashtuns and to do a kind of long-term ethnography in a village to understand this kind of social movements. So it's a guess. It's, uh, on my side, it's a guess based on my knowledge of another, uh, another group. But it's, I have a few hints uh, that, indeed, the Taliban are the, a new class of rather poor people from poor families, from poor and modest layers of society, who are, first of all, targeting the leaders of their own group. So I think power, it's, for me, power is still something, uh, an enigma. How, I, I have a kind of Weberian, once again, approach. So for me, power is it's an enigma. How can some people force other people or convince other people to act for their own sake and own ends? Uh, you need resources for that, and you need legitimacy once again. Two things the Afghan state doesn't have. You need resources. Let me be back to resources. Afghanistan has absolutely no resources today, except poppy. So if you are looking at the resources within this country, most of them are coming from outside. It's what I would call transnational resources. So the first one, I think it's quite uh, evident, it's trading networks. Uh, I was uh, mentioning uh, uh, Poppy. I think, obviously, Poppy brings a lot of money within this country. You know that more than 90% of world heroin comes from Afghanistan at last. So you have a huge amount of money coming from Poppy, but you have also other kind of uh, uh, trade going around this country, like uh, water coolers and uh, televisions and so on. So it's not only, I would say, illegal commodities. You have trade is very intense in Afghanistan now. The second one, obviously, it's the Islamic network, uh, Al Qaeda. So Afghans sometimes they they have a joke. On the left they have Al Qaeda, Qaeda meaning profit, and on the right they have Al Qaeda. But actually, uh, I should probably not say Islamic network, but some, something like military networks. Because the Taliban, they certainly get some uh, support from transnational networks. But what about the government? The government is totally dependent on military support from outside. So we have two uh, political actors in, in Afghanistan which are dependent on something else, so something from coming from outside. 
But at the same time, I think these two kind of phenomena are out of reach for an ethnographer. You cannot do field work, uh, or maybe you can do it among the, the, the American group to understand how they are doing, but not among the Taliban, and certainly not among the drug, the drug dealers and, and traffickers. So first, I have worked on these kind of things, migratory networks, bringing remittances, a lot, a lot. It's massive. I, do, I, I, I worked a lot of, uh, on these kind of things, so I want to move on my present day concern, which is humanitarian networks. Probably of the four, it's the weakest, the smallest uh, amount of resources, but still it's targeting very specific people, the middle class, to say it like that, urban people. And that's why I think it's extremely important, historically it has been in the West, to allow, uh, the, the, I'm saying the, the middle class, so I think it's very important to understand that somehow the, humanitarian, uh, the, the importance of humanitarian assistance is, relies also on its capacity to keep something like a middle class within the country. So I think somehow, structurally, Taliban and uh, social, uh, civil society militants are quite similar in the fact that they depend on something coming from outside. Maybe some are rather rural people and some are the rather urban people. So you have this divide, I think, between urban and rural which is probably one of the deepest gap of this society. But if we say Taliban is not a genuine Afghan movement, because if we don't, if we cut the links with Al Qaeda, they will just collapse. What's about human rights activists? What's about feminism, feminists in Afghanistan? Do you think they will still be able to play such an important role on the public sphere in Afghanistan without the assistance of USAID? GTZ, DFID, and so on, and the United Nations. So we are, once again, confronted to two families of political activists which cannot exist without this support. But I'm not saying that it, they are not genuine movements at the same time. That's very different. They are using these resources coming from outside, but they are still real, I would say, uh, social movements from the, from the grassroots, if you want. Mm -hmm. Uh, who will think that if USID stops uh, helping uh, human rights activists, they will disappear like that by magic? So why should we, could we imagine that's the same for Taliban? These two kind of groups, somehow, they are here for a long time, I think, and we have to, to imagine a scenario on the future of Afghanistan accepting this fact. So I'm very inspired by... Um, uh, by some authors who are trying to use the term, uh, the, the concept of governmentality, uh, the transnational governmentality. So basically, you have a whole set of institutions now, uh, UN agencies, uh, like uh, UNHCR, UNDP. You have also NGOs, like uh, Médecins Sans Frontières, uh, Oxfam, Save the Children, who are extremely present in Afghanistan and who conduct somehow sta state-like activities. So you, 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 it's a collapse or co collusion between the global and the local, because suddenly you have local pe people, if you want, who are directly connected to global resources by passing the state. And these networks are extremely important today. So it's not, we cannot, I think, only keep our analysis on Afghanistan looking at the state and society. There is something which is not in between, which is just transversal to everything, which is this kind of new, de that's difficult for me, deterritorialized governmentality, deterritorialized power. So I, I, I run quite pretty fast, actually. So uh, let me move a, a little bit further. So trading networks. So that's a photograph taken in 96 in Hasni at the time of the town of Hasni was in the hands of the Taliban, but that's uh, a place which was <coughs> controlled by the Shi a Shiite commander who was um, allied with Massoud. So he was running the airport of Hasni uh, like a kind of pocket between the Taliban, and he was talking with them and sharing. So once again, we, we, don't, we didn't have at that time big blocks. It was amazing to see this commander who was probably sending some soldiers and fighters in Kabul 
uh, fighting uh, on the side of Masoud against the Taliban, but locally going along, uh, along. And they were trading, and that's basically the kind of trading activities you can find everywhere in Afghanistan. And um, here it's mostly tea and sugar and wheat and flour coming from Pakistan. The second one is uh, the Islamic networks. That's a photograph taken in 96-2 in Bamiyan. That's the, the, the Mujahideen of the SB Wahdat, so the Shiite party, if you want. Most of them are from Kabul. Most of them went for the first time in Hazarajat, in the rural place at that time, for fighting. And uh, obviously, uh, they were, once again, uh, most of their commanders were uh, historically linked to uh, Khomeinist movement. And uh, there, once again, in the early 80s, the target of these groups were clearly the tribal chief and the Sayyid, so if you want, the traditional elites. And they took over. So it's very clear uh, in, the, in the 80s, among the Hazaras, you had a kind of social revolution, and a new elite took p power using the support of Iran at that time. And, um, and obviously, and legitimizing their upward mobility in the name of Islam, and saying we don't have to obey, we have to understand. And uh, it was a kind of, sorry for the term, but modernization project somehow. So once again, I think uh, something similar is going along now in the South. So the migratory networks, so that's uh, a photograph taken much later, I think in 2004. And I was, uh, I was interviewing someone, uh, Hawaladar, uh, and these people in the, in, the, in the end of the truck containers were starting to count money, and they counted for 20 minutes, dollars. And at last, I asked them, I'm sorry, but may I ask you how much? And it was $20,000 sent by a cousin from London. So that's huge. That's much more than the humanitarian assistance. And that's small streams which make, I think, a big, big difference for Afghans and Afghan families within the country. So much more efficiently, I would say, used somehow than the humanitarian assistance. So Afghans, they didn't wait for assistance to, to develop survival and coping strategy, and finally they did pretty well. So that's the Hawala system. I don't want to explain it further, because I want to spend this, the five last minutes. I have 10 minutes, I think, to be fair. <laughs> Let me give, uh, give me 20 minutes to talk about, <laughs> no. <laughs> no, give me a few minutes to talk about humanitarian assistance. So that's UNAMA. The, the, uh, UN mil uh, political uh, compounds in Kabul. Look at that. It's quite amazing. Most of these cars are used to move from the office to, to the house of the expatriates, basically. So just making the traffic of Kabul unbelievable. So, so just uh, um, uh, the last film of uh, David Edwards is Kabul Transit, mm -hmm. but very sometimes, very often, the transit is a little bit blocked in Kabul uh, by the NATO troop, by, uh, by the American troop, and these big, big, big land cruisers. And obviously, uh, uh, Afghans, they complain very bitterly against that. And uh, I'm visiting Afghanistan uh, for not so much time than uh, David Edwards and obviously Nazif Sharani, but still for 15 years. And I can tell you the, the, the contrast the contract of trust between Afghans and expatriates is just dropping. So until recently, I would say 2004, Afghans were very welcoming. Now it's, I think, absolutely misleading to believe that the, the, the war of heart and minds can be won. It has been lost several years ago, and we have just to acknowledge that. The Afghans, they don't welcome us like in the past. I have experienced it very strongly by myself in my, I would say, if I didn't have this long, long lasting relationship, I think it's very spectacular. And so my uh, entry point to uh, the humanitarian networks is the NSP, the National Solidarity Program, which is a very ambitious program run by the World Bank, about $1 billion between 2003 and 2010. It's supposed to last until next year, which is, I don't want to enter in, it's like a paramide. You have, first you have to uh, elect 
local uh, councils. And these councils, they have to work like small NGOs, but supported and advised by NGOs, but real NGOs. And these elected councils, they are somehow an extra structure. And it's very interesting because this project was, uh, let's say, implemented by the MRD, so the Minister of Rural Rehabilitation and Development. And the MRD wanted somehow to transform these CDCs in local structure of governance, more beyond the mandate of development. And they had to struggle against the Minister of Interior, saying, no, 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 that's our field. And uh, in 2003, it was a year before the first elections, the first presidential elections, I think the NSP was used somehow as a, <laughs> as a campaign tool for Karzai to convince that for the first time, the Afghan rulers were looking and taking care of the rural population. But uh, at that time, I think many people, uh, uh, many stakeholders uh, dreamed about allowing the emergence of a new class of rural people who were convinced by the benefits of human rights and uh, female empowerment and so on. Once again, it failed. It's quite clear. We have to be cautious. And now I tend to think that Karzai has moved the way of the NSP, which is still, if you are looking at official texts, considered to be a success story. It's this success story of the rebuilding of Afghanistan by the World Bank, by everybody. But I think, basically, it's not, not anymore in the priorities of Karzai. And we can see it in uh, mid-2007. Karzai has created uh, IDLG, Independent Directorate for Local Governance, which basically uh, put aside both the MRD and the Minister of Interior, because it took many things from the Minister of Interior, for instance, appointing district and provincial governors. It's not no more the MOI, it's this, this directorate which directly depends on the president. And at the same time, now it's clearly the move is to work with the traditional elites, Arbob and Khan and these kind of things. So I think the momentum of the NSP is gone even if the rhetoric is still very positive. So um, I, didn't wa I wanted to explain you a little bit how I proceed on the field, but I will not do that. So that's a place where I'm working a lot, trying to map social networks, starting from the genealogies and these kind of things. Uh, but um, what is very interesting here is I think we have once again to accept and to put in the center of our concern the fact that political life is political, uh, social life is political, even at the family level, even at, at the hamlet level, even at the village level. And each of these levels are arenas for power struggles. So we don't have to think that we, are able to, we will be able to bypass the bad commanders <laughs> the bad jihadis, the bad Taliban, and to reach the real population. Because the real population, they are part of these games. And I can show you uh, this nice uh, hamlet, uh, actually how deeply divided it is about around water. And more you pour resources, somehow more you feed this struggle, this local struggle. I don't think there is any way to escape from that. But at least, uh, and that will be more or less my conclusion, we have to acknowledge that humanitarian assistance is inherently political. We have to acknowledge that we are just adding more resources, and that these resources will just feed the struggle for local power, national power, and so on. But we have also to, to, to be absolutely aware that we are not in a world where you have the global here somewhere, and you have the local there. Everything is connected. And through, I think, this uh, transnational uh, uh, governmentality, everything is blur blurred. And I would say the, c the members of the civil society, the human rights activists, and the Taliban somehow are two faces of this globalization. And we have to, not to judge here, to take it, to understand it, to understand the social forces behind, and to understand that even humanitarian assistance is feeding somehow war. I think that's it for now. <laughs>